Good evening. Thanks for being here with me for another sermon. I'm so thankful you're here. I have now started a daily scripture reading uh, in the shorts on YouTube. I'd love for you to come and be a part of that comment and so we can interact and just talk about God's word. But let's get to the matter at hand. Tonight I'm going to bring scripture to you and we're going to talk about the life and death of Stephen. So before we get into this scripture, let us go into a word of prayer. Sovereign Lord, Almighty God, I'm just so thankful for today. Lord, be with us and keep us safe during this turbulent time in our country and with all the unrest, Lord. I pray for our brothers and sisters that are across the seas, wherever they may be, that they would be protected and uplifted and encouraged, and that the church here in America would stand firm even when persecution does come. I thank you for all that you've done and continue to do through your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the life and death of Stephen. Let's go to Acts 6, 1 through 7. Let us go to where Stephen's journey, it would seem, begins. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to ministering of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Paramenus, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set apart, they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So, here we see, at least as far as we know it, Stephen's journey with the church. So, let's break down what's going on here. So, back then, it was hand-to-mouth food situations. There was not plentiful amounts of food as there are today here in America where I am and where the multitude of the majority of the people that listen to this are today. So, the church was really a grassroots movement in the distributing of food and water to the less fortunate. The Hellenists are Greek-speaking Jews, and so their argument or their complaint was that their particular widows were being neglected. So with that being said, there, there didn't want to be any division amidst the church. So as we should, we gathered everybody for, they gathered everybody for a meeting. And they said, hey, look, as apostles, we shouldn't stop what we're doing to fix this scenario. Let us appoint people to fix this scenario so that we can continue on in the task at hand that we were given. And then we'll give you a task to do also. Well, one of these people that were picked was Stephen. And I want us to think about, and I want us to talk about why he was picked. Well, first of all, there was some, there was some um, criteria you had to meet to be picked, right? So first of all, you had to be good repute or good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, so you had to be of good reputation, full of the Spirit, which means if you were full of the Spirit, you would have fruit to identify the fact that you were full of the Spirit. You had to be a wise person, and your reputation had to be, had to be proceeding you in the, in the right way. Now think about that today. You as a Christian, if the scenario happened to you and your congregation, would you be among those chosen for such a task? Can you say that your reputation is proceeding you in the best, most Christ-honoring, most God-glorifying way today? I think that's something that we all should ask ourselves. We should examine ourselves. Is, how do people view us? You notice that Stephen doesn't say a thing here. They just chose him. It wasn't by his words he was chosen. It didn't have a volunteering process that went on. They said, Pick seven. Pick them. Choose people that the group knew to be the best reputation, the wisest, and the most filled with the Holy Spirit 
shown by the fruit of their life. And so we look at this scenario where Stephen is chosen to give this task to take care of the less fortunate. And it's an honor to do so. You know, these are, this is an honorable thing to be given. You, you're being chosen because of your life, because of how you lived, because of how people viewed you in the church and your wise, which means you're making the right decisions day in and day out, not for the betterment of you, but for the betterment of others. You're wise in your dealings with others, whether it be outsiders or brothers and sisters within the church. And so Stephen is chosen for this. And I don't want us to just gloss over this first part because I think so often we get caught up in politics here in America. It's all about politics and, and you know, what they said and what this said. And that we really ought to be looking at the reputation of the people, not what they say, but how they live and what they do. And we should be discerning with these people and with whoever you're dealing with. Why would you continue to deal with somebody that steals when their reputation is that they're a thief? That would be unwise of you to do that. So you would not be considered a wise person if you continued to keep the company of a thief, which is his reputation. So my question to you is, how does your reputation precede you? What does the body of believers that you're a part of think about you? And the, the incorrect response is, well, I don't care what they think. Well, you should. You should care what they think. You should care how you're viewed within the body. I'm not talking about the world here, okay? I'm not talking about the pagans outside of the body of Christ. I'm talking about the body of Christ, which is a body, all hands, feet, eyes, mouth, ears, all of it. We should care how we're viewed within the body. And if there's an issue, it should be addressed gently, lovingly, with rebuke and correction. And so let's not tarry here too, too long, but full of the Holy Spirit. How do you know if you're full of the Holy Spirit? Well, there are certain sects of Christianity that would say the only way that you can know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit is if you speak in tongues. I, I don't see that as a designation of the only thing that can be shown if somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit. There are a multitude of gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit. Not everybody that receives the Holy Spirit can speak in tongues. That's not, it is by the discernment of the Spirit to give the gift, however many gifts is given, when the gift is given, and to whom the gift is given. So it's not a, it's not a mold that everybody gets this thing. But what we do know is we have a list of things of fruits of the Spirit. So if people are showing these specifics, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, compassion, all of those fruits of the Spirit, if somebody is producing those and continuing in them, there is that is a good visual of somebody that is filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about somebody who's just a good person. There is none good. No, not one. I'm talking about somebody who is maturing in the faith, who's maturing in Christ, who wants to look more like Christ than the world. And that was Stephen. Stephen wanted to look more like Jesus and act like Jesus than those outside. He wanted to be like Christ, and therefore it showed in his life. So let's go forward. So now we're going to fast forward here. Acts 7, 51 through 53. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of fill the blank in here because there's a lot uh, in chapter 7 that we could talk about. But we're going we're gonna to buy, so here it is. Stephen gets pretty much wrongfully accused. Um, and people are not liking, he's about doing signs and wonders. He's healing people. He's spreading the good news. He's doing things that show that the kingdom of Christ is advancing. And of course, there is those that are jealous of this. There are those that try to repute or, or, or refute some things, but they can't because Stephen is just so filled with the Holy Spirit. The wisdom of the Holy Spirit just can't be undone. They can't, they can't win. And so that makes people angry and all, they bring him before the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and all of that. And they begin to question him and berate him. But when he walked inside of the, the proceeding, they said his face looked like an angel. 
He was so filled with the Spirit of God, it was, it was showing outwardly. It was, you were able to physically see it on him. That's how filled up he was with the Spirit. And so as they questioned Stephen, Stephen goes into a great sermon. First of all, he gives them an absolute history lesson of the Jews and of Moses and Abraham and all the way to where they are today. Then he talks about what they're doing. So first he gives them a history lesson and then he shows his knowledge of the scriptures. Let's read. So we're going to do 51 through 53. This was his last statement at the end of the sermon that he preached. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You, have re you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Whoo! That is bold. And amen. We should be so bold. So at the end of all of the lesson that he gives them, he gives them a rebuke and explains to them that just because they sit in the seats of the law and the Pharisees and the judges over the people, they are not acting in accordance to the very law that they claim to adhere to. And their forefathers killed the prophets that were the ones that were trying to tell them what they were doing was wrong. So Stephen stands in the place of the prophets of old, telling the leadership, look, you are stiff-necked, and you're not listening, and you're not doing the right thing. And the very one that was prophesied about all through the ages was here, and you killed him. So how do we react? when we're brought before and told to give an answer for why we're doing what we're doing. Why is it so hard for us today and age to do the right thing? What seems to be the problem? I don't understand. Or maybe I do and it's just so grievous that I try not to think about it. The law is imprinted on our hearts. We claim to be Christian, yet we'll shrink from the the slightest qualm. And here we see Stephen standing in front of the leadership of the day of the nation of Israel. That would be like you being brought before the leadership of America and being put on trial, because that's exactly what happened here. He's put on trial and told to give an account. What is all this we're hearing about you? Can you say you would stand up boldly like Stephen? And proclaim the iniquity of the leadership that was over you? And then proclaim Christ in the very same breath? We ought to all be like this. We ought to all live our life in such boldness as to not shrink from death. But to live for Christ and Christ alone. Stephen knew that. He would, there was no fear in him of the leadership. There should be no fear in us of the leadership. We should, not be, we should not be trembling at what happens in the White House. We should be trembling at what God has to say or what God thinks of the scenario. That's where we should tremble. We shouldn't tremble at COVID. We should tremble at what the Almighty would do to us. That's how we should tremble. That's what we should fear. Stephen knew that. And he was willing to put it all on the line. Are you willing to put it all on the line? Are you willing to lose your job? Think about it today, right? We live in a very woke culture. We live in a very politically correct culture where we don't even know what a woman is or a man is or if anybody could be anything at any time with any pronouns and blah. You may, there may come a time sooner than you think where they say, hey, look, you, you're going to have to Make a decision here. You either acknowledge the fact that there's more than two genders or you go find another job. 
or you acknowledge the fact of whatever the case may be, something against our faith. What are you going to do in that moment? Because it's coming. Please believe. It's coming. We must understand, people, that the time is short. There's no time to shrink now. For the time is at hand to be bold. In a culture that is exceedingly evil, continually, it would almost seem as the Lord has left this nation because of the exceedingly great evil that is abounding. We have an opportunity here as a church to be like Stephen, to stand up and to say, you're wrong, that's wrong, with no fear. Remember, do not fear the ones that can kill the body and after that do nothing, but fear the one who can kill the body and the soul in, in hell. For those who deny Christ in front of man will be denied in front of his father. Fear that God. Don't fear men or what they can do to you here. Fear the one that can do to you eternally. Let's continue. So Stephen goes, he preaches, he proclaims, he rebukes, he, he confronts. He calls sin, sin. And then we get the response, right? There's always a response to something like this, where somebody was being so bold. So 58 through 60. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out in a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he cried, called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This, um, <clears throat> this scripture is always very moving to me because, first of all, there's, a, there's always a react. There's always, I've seen it to be two different reactions. There may be more, but these are the two that are most prevalent. When you call somebody out in their sin, the two reactions I see the most are a brokenness and a repenting heart and an acknowledgement of that sin or an anger, bitter enragement that how dare you call me out on that. And that's what you're seeing here in the book of Acts with Stephen. They were enraged and the result was anger and they drug Stephen out. But before they did that, before they did any of that, Stephen was given a gift. He was given a gift. And this is the part that grabs me so tightly. Every other place in scripture you see the Lord seated at the right hand of God. But when Stephen's eyes are opened and the veil is dropped from him and he looks up to heaven and proclaims what he sees, Christ isn't seated. He's standing next to the Father as almost to say, one of mine, one of the first are going to be killed in my name. I'm going to stand up. I want to see this. I want to see this man of faith. And as he stands, as in approval of Stephen, is what he's doing. Stephen gets this glorious sight into heaven, into the risen Christ. And gets to see, before he's killed, the love of God has looked upon him. Oh, what a glorious sight that must have been in that moment. He, he probably didn't, he wouldn't even have cared what happened after that. And I want us to look at this, right? Their next reaction was to be angry at him and then get rid of the very thing that called us out on our garbage. We, can, we can't bear it. We can't bear for somebody to call us out on our sin. So we must take it outside of the city and kill it in the same way they killed Christ. Not, the, not, not in the same manner, but in the same process. Carry them outside the city and end them out there. 
And so here we see Stephen. So they stop their ears up. It's too much for them to bear. They cry aloud to fill the air with more noise so they can't hear Stephen proclaiming the beautiful gift he's been given to see the risen Christ standing at the right hand of God. Standing. He's standing. And so we get to the stoning. And stoning is a very brutal thing. It is not a bullet to the head or a lethal injection. It is a very brutal and basic way to kill somebody where you throw stones at them until they are no longer alive. And I always wondered this for a long time. I always thought, well, if somebody was just fast enough, they could outrun this person or this group of people. It always wondered me how they got it done, you know, effectively anyway. And then I saw a video of this happening in modern day and at least the one that I saw, they would bury them up to their stomachs in the dirt. And only this part would be exposed. And then they would stone them so they couldn't go anywhere. And they'd stone them then. Now, I don't know if that's how it happened to Stephen. But if we see Stephen's life right up to the very end, he cries out to the Lord Jesus, receive his spirit. And before he falls asleep, he is still being a servant, even till the end. He doesn't care about himself. He cares about the very people that are stoning him. It was out of love that he, that he called them out. He was hoping they would acknowledge their sin and turn and be saved. But they denied it. And even as he's dying and bleeding, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Don't hold the sin of murder against them. Give them an opportunity still, Lord, to turn from their wicked ways, even though I'm gone to the end. Stephen remained true to Christ and held on to being a servant all the way till the end. Will you be that bold? And will you hold on to the very end? Guys, I love you. And God bless.